The following program is brought to you by Caltech. So good evening. It's uh, great to see such a large crowd here. Uh, I am Tom Prince. I'm a professor of physics here at Caltech, and I'm the director of the Keck Institute for Space Studies. Uh, to, just to begin the evening, I'd like to uh, uh, make, have a few thank yous. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank the uh, W.M. Uh, Keck Foundation. They're a Southern California Foundation, just an excellent uh, a group to work with. They support all the programs of the Keck Institute for Space Studies, and in particular, they support uh, the, the presentations like, uh, such as the one you're going to be seeing this evening. Uh, secondly, I'd uh, like to uh, also thank our co-sponsors here, the Planetary Society, just another excellent organization to work with. We are very glad to be working with them, and we've worked with them uh, over several years now uh, to bring presentations like, like this uh, to, the, to you. Uh, last but not least, I'd like to thank the uh, staff of the Keck Institute for Space Studies and also the staff of the uh, Beckman Auditorium. Uh, it's it's uh, not easy to put on a uh, presentation in an event like this. It takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of planning, and I think they all, the staff and the staff of the Keck Institute, also, we should go. Thank you. So what is the Keck Institute? Uh, those of you who have been to some of our other events uh, already know a little bit about this. But what we do is each year we pick out perhaps about a half dozen uh, areas of space science or technology that we think are especially ripe for exploration and uh, thinking about them, think tank and brainstorming type activities to see if we can come up with new and revolutionary new concepts for uh, space science and technology and space missions. Uh, once we have chosen those areas, then we convene about two dozen of the best experts uh, from the Caltech campus, from JPL, and from the, all over the world to come together and to brainstorm those activities. And actually, the, the group of two dozen or so uh, investigators are sitting right about here in the audience. Uh, I'll uh, talk a little bit about them later, but that's the group who is coming together to uh, uh, study uh, possibilities for uh, exploration of interstellar uh, space. Uh, one thing though, um, uh, just a little bit tongue-in-cheek now, uh, you've turned all, all turned off your cell phones, right? But uh, if you didn't and you googled interstellar, what do you think you'd get? Does anybody know? So, so yes, the movie. I heard the movie. Yeah, so so, so uh, uh, there is a movie uh, called Interstellar. Uh, it's about uh, interstellar travel. It's coming out in about uh, two months. It's a Christopher, it's a Christopher Nolan movie. Uh, uh, the, one of the, the uh, prime scientific advisor from that is our own Kip Thorne. And that will tell you something about interstellar travel and be very entertaining. However, this is not a commercial for that movie although it is free advertising for that movie, and I think you'll enjoy it. But the people who are really doing the work of thinking about how you actually would do in a practical sense uh, exploration of interstellar space are sitting here in the audience. They're the people that want to do a mission to interstellar space to follow up on the Voyager missions within the next uh, 10 to 20 years. So, so when you're done, though, you can uh, certainly Google or uh, DuckDuckGo or wherever you want uh, and uh, see, uh, learn about the, uh, the entertainment uh, uh, view of interstellar space. So uh, what I'd like to do uh, just uh, uh, to start off uh, the evening is identify the three leads of the program uh, on uh, uh, interstellar science and technology that are here this evening. We always have three leads for our program. One lead is uh, from the Caltech campus, one lead is from uh, JPL, and one, lead, one is the external lead. So the first person I'd like to recognize is the external lead. Uh, that's Lou Friedman. Lou, you want to stand up? Okay. So, so, so. 
So Lou, Lou is, uh, many of you know, is a former director of the Planetary Society, so uh, a, a nice connection there. Uh, and then now I, am, I have the pleasure of introducing our second lead, who will introduce the third lead, uh, because uh, both of them will be up here on the stage uh, today. So, I, uh, so it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Leon Alkali, a respected engineer at JPL. He's the second lead in the program, and he will uh, be your host for the rest of the evening. Good evening. Thank you, Tom. And I also would like to thank the uh, Keck Institute of Space Studies, Tom Prince and Michelle Judd, for uh, being such uh, wonderful hosts and, and organizers. I'd like to uh, thank my co-authors on the proposal, Ed Stone and Lou Friedman, and uh, also to thank the participants, the co-investigators on the proposal, uh, about 30 people who are here uh, in the audience and uh, during these uh, f a few days of the, of the workshop. So um, my name is Leon Alkali from JPL. It is uh, a great honor uh, for me to be here and I'm very humbled to be here in the presence of our distinguished uh, panel here. And uh, you'll hear from uh, each one of them uh, this evening. So let me first uh, introduce, as you can imagine, each one of our distinguished uh, uh, panelists here are uh, could have, uh, I could read the, a resume for a very long time, so they've each agreed to make it very, very short. And so um, Ed Stone uh, is a professor of physics at Caltech and a member of the National Academy of Sciences. He is the executive director of the 30-meter telescope International Observatory. Since 1972, he has been the project scientist for Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, which were launched in 1977. In 2012, Voyager 1 was the first human-made object to reach the interstellar space. From 91 to 2001, Ed Stone was the director of NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, and perhaps the highlight of his uh, career, in December of 2003, he was featured on the Colbert Report. I'd like to welcome Professor Freeman Dyson, who is a fellow of the Royal Society. Uh, and, and, uh, he is an English-born American theoretical physicist and mathematician, famous for his work in quantum electrodynamics, solid-state physics, astronomy, and nuclear engineering. He is now a retired professor from the Princeton Institute for Advanced Study. He is author of many visionary papers and books. During the 50s and 60s, he worked on Project Orion, which aimed to build a nuclear bomb propelled spaceship for human exploration of Mars, Saturn, and beyond. His books deal with human problems raised uh, by science and technology, and especially topics of war and peace. Freeman Dyson. Dr. Mae Jemison is an American physician and engineer, a NASA astronaut, and a member of the National Academy of Sciences Institute of Medicine. She became the first African-American woman to travel in space when she went into orbit aboard the Space Shuttle Endeavor on September 12, 1992. Dr. Jemison is a professor uh, of environmental sciences at Dartmouth College working on technology and sustainable development. She is founder of the Dorothy Jemison Foundation for Excellence, focusing on excellence in education, especially the Earth We Share science camps. She is an entrepreneur and leader of the 100-year Starship Initiative. She was also featured on an episode of Star Trek. So just to give you a little bit of an um, overview of how we'll conduct this, uh, this evening. So um, in a few seconds, I'll take a seat and uh, I'll ask each one of our panelists uh, uh, a, a question and give them about, about five or 10 minutes to uh, present their, their, um, their points of view. And then we'll gauge, engage in a, in a discussion. And uh, in the second part of the evening, we'll uh, open up the discussion for questions from the uh, audience, there are two microphones in the uh, hallways that you can use to ask questions. And uh, we will be getting also, I believe this uh, evening is being webcast, 
and so we will be getting questions uh, from the uh, from the internet, and we'll um, field those questions as they as they come in. So my first um, question and first uh, topic is for Professor Ed Stone. Uh, if you can please. Uh, just uh, give us a perspective. We're talking about the interstellar medium. We're talking about uh, other stars and, and so on. It would be interesting for the audience to just get a geographical uh, perspective on the distances, where we are relative to Earth, interstellar medium, and so on. Well, thank you, Leanne. And greetings to everybody this evening. It's really great to talk about uh, Voyager's epic journey. Uh, to the edge of interstellar space. It was actually two years ago that Voyager 1 became the first human-made object to leave the solar bubble uh, and enter the space between the stars. And uh, you might say, why did it take so long? It was 35 years, moving at a million miles per year. And that's because the sun, uh, seen in this visible image with sunspots, uh, uh, basically creates a bubble around itself. You can't see the wind in this image because it's, uh, it's the corona, but you can see the wind uh, when you have an image which is where you have a coronagraph that blocks the sun, uh, the sun itself, and one can now see the wind streaming radially outward in all directions from the sun between one and two million miles per hour. Uh, and that wind blows out and out and out until finally it reaches the pressure of what's outside. Uh, so this bubble, this heliospheric bubble, which actually is a comet-shaped bubble because there's an interstellar wind uh, coming from, as you see, from a particular direction, which then distorts the bubble into this long comet-shaped object. When Voyager was launched in 1977, we really had no idea how big the bubble was. Well, we had an idea, but it was uncertain by a factor of two or three. And when you're trying to get there, a factor of two or three makes a whole lot of difference of how long <laughs> it takes. Uh, fortunately, it wasn't too big. And uh, it was basically 35 years uh, when, we fought, when Voyager 1, which is the spacecraft you can see, uh, which entered interstellar space. Now, what's the difference between inside the heliosphere, the sun's bubble, and outside? Well, inside the heliosphere, the wind comes from the sun. It's an ionized plasma, a million or more miles per hour, and it carries with it the magnetic field of the sun. Outside, in the brownish colored areas you see there, is interstellar space, where the wind comes from the explosion of other stars uh, billion, millions of years ago. Uh, and the magnetic field is the magnetic field of the Milky Way galaxy, which is then trapped and carried by that wind. So there's a distinct difference from being inside, which is where all the planets are, where all missions have to, until Voyager have been, is distinctly different from what's outside. And we're now beginning to explore uh, the space between the stars, although we are just starting. Uh, here, these things really do exist. Uh, this is a Hubble image of uh, one of these invisible astrospheres, but you can see in front of it the region where the interstellar wind it has, is impacting and creates kind of a bow wave uh, in, on, in the front. We're inside of one of these objects and now have f f finally uh, emerged into the bright band region you see, which is the, the bow shock, a bow wave in front of the heliosphere that you can't see. Now, I can't show you a picture of the Earth's heliosphere. It's invisible, but I can show you a picture of my kitchen sink. <laughs> <laughs> And you'll notice, and you've probably all seen this, you'll notice that the water, in, where the water hits the bottom of the sink, it moves radially outward faster than the speed of waves in the water. It's in that sense supersonic. And it just moves out until it's so thin, it can't hold off what's outside, and it abruptly slows down and turns and goes down the drain. That's essentially what's happening in three dimensions with our heliosphere, except the scale is enormously larger. Uh, it took, it's about 12 billion miles from the sun to where Voyager 1 finally entered interstellar space, left uh, this behind. So this, one, one last slide just to give you an idea of how we're just beginning, basically. Uh, you can see the planets lined up, and the number 10 is 10 astronomical units. That's where Saturn is, 10 times as far from the sun as the Earth, almost, uh, uh, almost a billion miles. Uh, then there's uh, Neptune and Pluto shown there, and the bright band, you see that arc, that's that interaction region between what's outside and what's inside, and the red dot 
is where Voyager is today, uh, at about 129 times as far from the Earth as the Sun is. But this scale is logarithmic. The next 10 over is 10 cubed, 1,000 times as far. The next one over is 10,000 times as far. And at 10,000 times as far from the sun, there's a cloud of comets, which are part of the solar system. So most of the solar system is outside the solar bubble. It's kind of counterintuitive, but most of it is outside. And only when we get to about uh, 40,000 years from now will we actually cross uh, and come closer to another star than we are to the sun today. So although we've made a historic step into interstellar space, it's really just a tiny little step on a journey uh, that will, in fact, for the spacecraft, last for billions of years. So that's... That's the... That's... Okay. That's the... That's the <laughs> <laughs> but I have one more question for you. Yeah. Um, it would be interesting to think uh, and provide a perspective on what this discovery means to you personally, to space exploration, if you can give us some commentary on, on, on just that perspective. Well, you know, historically, humans have explored, and, uh, and I think the great missions of exploration are the first circumnavigation of the globe, well, Apollo, the footsteps, first steps on the moon. I think this is now the first human-made object leaving the solar bubble and entering interstellar space. It's that kind of an event, which is a, it's a historic event, and it's just the beginning of a whole new era that and part of our workshop is, of course, is looking forward to what is now can, what we need to do as we enter this new regime where nothing, no human-made object has been before. Thank you. Beautiful. Dr. Freeman Dyson, how are you? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> so I've enjoyed reading uh, your books on many different topics. And relative to the workshop, I've enjoyed reading your paper, I believe, in the late 1960s about the Orion Project and about uh, your vision of uh, human uh, uh, exploration and the ability of, uh, of humans to one day reach even uh, a distant star and so on. So I want, uh, I, if you could please provide, in general, um, a, a perspective on, uh, on human exploration, on space exploration as you see it um, from your point of view. Yeah, well, it, of course, I was enormously impressed with this Voyager mission which Ed Stone ran, which has done such an amazing job of exploring it. it. I mean, starting with Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus and Neptune, and now going on into the interstellar re regions. So uh, that's, of course, part of the story we've lived through. And, and uh, how is it going to continue? Well, big things happened, and just in the last five years or so, the uh, whole picture of the way the galaxy is populated has changed. We thought, sort of in the tr traditional times, we thought that there was the sun and the planets, and then there was this huge gap, and then there were the stars, so that you had missions inside the solar system, and you had missions to the stars, which were millions of times further away, and nothing much of interest in between. What has happened in the last five years is we've discovered that the galaxy is actually littered with all kinds of stuff, interesting stuff in between the, the planets and the stars. The Kepler mission, which is a space mission looking for planets around other stars, has been fantastically successful so that Kepler mission alone has discovered thousands of new planets. But in addition to all those, there are other orphan planets, which we have good reason to believe are just about as common, there may be even more so, that there are planets which are formed without stars, just condensing out of interstellar dust at the same time as the stars condensed. There are also planets which were originally attached to stars and then get kicked out by encounters with other planets. And there are all sorts of other objects, asteroids, comets, meteors, of all sorts and sizes in between. And the populations get bigger and bigger as the objects get smaller. So there are about as many planets as there are stars. There are probably a thousand times as many objects of the sort of asteroid size 
as there are planets, and there are billions of times more objects of the cometary variety. Comets are of the order of a few kilometers in size, and we know there are billions of these objects attached to the sun and probably to all the other stars in the galaxy, and a huge fraction of those undoubtedly got free and are floating around in space. So when we are exploring, we're not just going to go all the way from here to the nearest stars in one jump. That's sort of the way Columbus did, going from here to America. That's what I call the Atlantic style of exploring. Much more likely for our future is the Pacific style of exploring, which was done by the Polynesians a thousand years earlier. The Polynesians were not interested in what was the other side of the Pacific Ocean. They were exploring the islands in between. And of course, they did an amazing job of settling the islands, sailing out with their canoes, with their chickens and pigs and children, <laughs> and making new homes on the way. So I see the Pacific style as the style we shall probably follow for the next 100 years or so. And it makes the voyages much more interesting if you have these islands where we can settle and flourish and explore in between. And the more we know about the universe, the more interesting it becomes. Almost invariably, things which look sort of boring when you only see them for the first time become far more interesting when you settle down and explore. So that's uh, my hopes for the future. So we've been talking for the last two days, and we'll be talking two days more about what we call sort of the interstellar missions. But actually, they're not interstellar. They are exploring little bits on the way. And that, that, that's, that's, what it, that's the way it will be. And I think it will continue to be as interesting in the future as it has been in the past. Thank you. There was another question that I, that I had discussed with you actually earlier, and that is your perspective on life, life in the universe, life on Earth, and, and our responsibility towards life. Do you want to say a few things about that? Yeah, well, this, of course, has nothing to do with science. This is now <laughs> philosoph philosophizing, or pontificating. But uh, the big question, which nobody knows the answer to, is whether we are alone in the universe. Do we have friends and colleagues out there in space? Of course, <coughs> the great thing is we don't know the answer. We may be all alone, or we may not. Either way, it's very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> of course, we all, in a way, we hope we'll find friends out there. It, that, that will be the most exciting, to learn how other c c creatures l learn to see the, the world they're living in, how different they are from us. I mean, undoubtedly, we'll have a huge amount to learn from them if we ever meet. If we are unlucky and we don't find in, a, a, aliens out there, then I do think we have a responsibility then to bring life to the universe. It's a, a great, ter ter terrible waste <laughs> to have all these de desert worlds with nothing much of interest going on. Life confined <laughs> to our little grain of sand here on, the, on this planet. So I, th I would say our destiny and our responsibility is to be the midwives <laughs> to allow life to spread, establish itself, and move out into the universe. The universe will be far more beautiful and far more interesting when life has taken it over. So that, that's something, of course, which is a very, very it will take a long time, and nobody knows when it will happen. But I see it as something to hope for and something uh, we should already start planning for. And I like to think it'll have a lot to do with biology rather than with engineering, that the, 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 the key to spreading life outwards is, of course, biotechnology rather than engineering. And, and we have to understand life and learn to 
grow creatures adapted to live in remote places, and then we can start. So the, the, the way I look at, at the future of space settlement is not humans in space suits trudging around on a frozen <laughs> landscape. <laughs> That, 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 that we tried that on the moon, and it was all right for a few days, but it was <laughs> Obviously, it was not really the right way to do it. But anyhow, in the future, we will spend an, uh, what I call a Noah's Ark egg that is a small object containing the seeds of life of all different kinds in the form of genetic information which is very, very light and small, a few, a few micrograms of DNA is enough for the whole biosphere of the planet. So those we shall send these little eggs to colonize the universe, and they will then evolve once we have sent them on their way. They will not need us anymore. They will evolve on their own. And then afterwards, when they are established, there will be a home for us to visit. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that's a good introduction to me. <laughs> <laughs> In so many ways. <laughs> Wonderful. So um, if you can give us a, a perspective, your own personal perspective, I mean, you're an astronaut and, and you've uh, achieved a lot as an astronaut. <laughs> And, uh, but you're also active in, in this field of, of uh, leading the 100-year starship and so on. So please give us a, a personal perspective on this, on this topic. So, so I brought some slides. And uh, I'm going to start off even a little bit further back than Polynesia mm -hmm. and further back, of course, than circumnavigation of the globe and start off with a proverb, the African proverb that says, no one shows a child a sky and recognize that we as humans have been involved with space exploration for thousands of generations. Because when you think about it, some of our earliest technology really revolved around the stars. We learned how to, to plant, right, by cycles and things like that, the, the, where the, the, the phases of the moon. That was really what Voyager is based on. It's based on the fact that one of our ancestors a thousand generations ago noticed that the stars were moving, right? That these little points of light were moving relative to each other. So if you really want to think of a phenomenal kind of technology observation or science, it's the person who figured out these things were moving 10 years ago. That little fleck was right there, right? At this time of night. So, so I want to start off by letting us know that we didn't have to be with Sputnik to be here. No one shows a child the sky. I did bring a picture of me in a space <laughs> 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 because as a little girl growing up, as a, as a child growing up in the 1960s, I assumed that by the time I was old enough to be an astronaut that I would be on another planet because we were moving that rapidly. There was no way that I imagined we would be anywhere else. I remember just being so jazzed about Voyager because it was doing this grand tour of the solar system and I wanted to be a part of it. It was one of those things that I definitely wanted to be a part of. When I went up into space, um, in 1992, I was actually a little bit irritated that I wasn't going to Mars, but I, you know, I took the <laughs> shuttle anyway. Um, but one of those things that happened as a result of that was a resolve to be involved even more over time. But bringing into my background of chemical engineering and medicine and environmental studies, and what do we really do with that? This is what I'm going to talk about is what is this whole interstellar space? So I'm sort of bridging the gap between um, we're just taking a little bitty step out. And can I say this almost this male point of view that you just sort of spread your eggs somewhere? <laughs> and they, uh, uh, so, 
So when we see space right now, this is what we think of, right? This is the shuttle. That's what, in fact, that is my shuttle launch. But this is a project I'm working on now called 100-Year Starship. 100-Year Starship is about making sure the capabilities exist to send humans to another starship system within the next 100 years. Notice I said make the capabilities exist. So here's the reality testing that we have to do. When we think about space exploration, again, this is it. It was a picture of the shuttle. This is me on, on the shuttle, on my flight. But we really want to transform from low Earth orbit to interstellar. This is what we're trying to do, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to be exactly this way, but this is what we're thinking about. This is not what 100-year starship is about making this connection. Let's think about the challenge of interstellar flight. So we heard about Voyager just coming out, but one idea was put three grains of sand inside of a cathedral, and the cathedral is more filled with sand than space is with stars. So we want to get a scale of the distance. This is the reason why it's an interesting problem. Here's another scale. Assume we're in Los Angeles, right? And there's New York, the two parts of the universe called the United States. <laughs> um, imagine that Los Angeles is the Earth and New York City is Alpha Centauri, our, our closest neighboring star is about 25 trillion miles away, 4.2 light years away. It takes light 4.2 years to get there. It takes light from the sun eight minutes to get from, to, to the Earth. Voyager has been traveling at over 35 thousand miles per hour pretty much since 1997. On that 2,000 some odd mile trip, if you use that scale, Voyager's only gone one mile. <laughs> it would take 70,000 years for Voyager to get there. It tells you that we have to do something different if we really want to make the capabilities exist. It means we must go much faster. We need different energy systems. It's a completely different ball game. In fact, it's the scale of this that makes everything different. It's the fact that we are so distant, it's going to take time, that makes us an interesting problem. Why does this make a difference? We have to change energy. We have to generate much more energy. We can't do it with chemical fuels. That's what we've been talking about. We even can't even do it with sun sails or anything else. We're going to have to figure out safe fission, safe fusion, safe antimatter, generate, store those kinds of energy. If we go a little bit down that road, all of a sudden we've transformed how we do energy here on Earth. We could look at clothing. Right now when we go up to the space station, we take our clothing with us. Well, you can't take enough boxcars of clothing up with you, right? Let's say we were able to go a tenth of light speed, you take 50 years, you can't take 50 years worth of clothing with you. But clothing is one of the most resource intense, most toxic things that we do on this planet. If we start to learn how to recycle our clothes, how to make our materials more rugged, then we change what we do on this planet. So there's the connection. I have another thing, this is the, sort of the philosophical point, but I think it's really important. I don't think that the technology is really the long pole in the tent. And I know I, you, my fellow workshop people, you can throw things at me. The long pole in the tent is people. Because imagine, we could get the whole ship built, everything ready to go. We figured out how to go a tenth of light speed. It's going to take us 50 years to get there. 10 years out, somebody says, well, I'm not doing that, <laughs> right? Just, you were in charge when we left, but I don't see anybody's going to make me do it here. <laughs> the whole issue around people's behavior, and it's our commitment that makes a difference. The reason why we're not on the moon now has nothing to do with technology. It has everything to do with public commitment and how we've kept people involved. So when I think about this 100-year starship, our whole issue is really seeing it as an inclusive, audacious journey that transforms life here on Earth and beyond. We have to make that connection. This isn't just about going tra-la-la someplace else. It's really about how we change life here on Earth. And if you think about it, everything that we need to go to another star system are the same capabilities we need to figure out how to live here on Earth as a species, because we're not doing too well right now. <laughs> but this may be a mechanism for us to help think about it. 100-year starship is there because we believe that there is a better future for us. That's our task. What we want to do is inspire an inclusive collective ambition, something that everyone can be involved in. We need another kind of adrenaline rush. 
Um, it's a mission to achieve human interstellar flight within the next 100 years. It's about getting those capabilities. You're not necessarily launching a mission. Being able to achieve that. But actually, it's a journey designed to enhance life on Earth. So it's those, those steps that we take. It's those things that we do together. Eugene Cernan said, we went to explore the moon and, in fact, discovered the Earth. And the question that I have and that I ask here is what will we discover from another star? That's the point of all of this. We learn so much about ourselves. What will we discover from another star? Thank you. So I, um, beautiful. I'd like to pick up on, on this topic. And in the first two days of our workshop, We've actually made some uh, wonderful progress. We've looked at science. We've looked at uh, science measurements and, 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 and topics of that nature. And, but we struggle. We struggle with uh, setting the right long-term vision with grounding it in what are the first few steps uh, in, in, in exploring the interstellar medium. And we're often um, constrained by what we believe NASA would do what we think is doable. NASA is many times, and most of the times, risk averse. So we find ourselves being constrained by what we think we can sell and, and promote uh, directly to NASA. And you've brought up a number of ideas and, and, and of going directly to the public and so on. So I'd like you to comment a, a little bit about reaching, reaching the public as a way of, of uh, promoting or, or building up this program. Well, again, I start with, I think space is one of those things we all connect with one way or the other. We've all looked up at the stars, whether we've wanted to go or not. No one would say, oh, I don't, I don't want you to tell me what's there if you know. Right? We all want to know. The way to connect with the public, I believe, is to invite them in is so that we understand that it takes more than rocket scientists and billionaires to make a space program. Right? Because it's really... For example, the people who actually put together the vehicle. You know, the astronauts were cool, all that kind of stuff. We wouldn't go anywhere if it were not for the people who put the tile on the shuttle, if it weren't for the secretaries who made sure that those connections were made, if it weren't for the lawyers who helped to put together, sign the agreements. Those things are actually part and parcel of a space program. I think it's by inviting people in. It's the artists who tell the stories, right? We have to tell our stories better. So what we're trying to do with 100 Year Starship, what I think this program is actually doing as well, is inviting more people to be a part of it. Um, I know as a kid, I was like just, I was just so excited about the Apollo program, but yet at the same time in my neighborhood, so many people felt like it didn't have anything to do with them, right? It was like, yay, that's really great for the US. What we have to do, I didn't bring my smartphone, but we have to get people to understand when they take out their smartphone and they have their map and they say, Siri or whoever, directions to, that they're holding space in their hand, that they're just as proud of that space in their hand as they are about how cool the form factor is. That's what we have to do, and we do that by getting more people involved, asking folks to participate in, in the ways in which they can participate. Just like I can't do the, a lot of the calculations that my colleagues are, are doing during this workshop, there are other things that they can't do, we can't necessarily put on the tile, dress ourselves, all of that. It's part and parcel of making more people involved. Thank you. Um, and I'd like to ask you if you can just add uh, maybe a few more comments on what your vision is. Uh, what are the possible next? What is a, let's say, a Voyager 3, a Voyager oh, Plus? Uh, what, what, what can we uh, uh, hope for, plan for? What are some of the the ideas you might have or that we've discussed in the workshop in terms of what are the, some of the next steps? Well, you know, if you have to go 10 times as far, you better go 10 times as fast, <laughs> right? <laughs> that's, that's, I think, really the, one of the keys is how do we get there more quickly? I mean, Voyager is almost a million miles every day, and yet it's taken 35 years to finally reach interstellar space, and that's just the beginning of the journey. Uh, so somehow propulsion is a critical element. Uh, communication, obviously the further away you get, the harder it is to communicate back what you've learned. Now all the historic missions of discovery 
the knowledge came back with the returning explorers. Uh, in this case, the knowledge has to come back from Voyager or whatever it is, because it's not coming back. And so communication is another critical issue. Power is another one, uh, because the, that spacecraft is out on its own, and uh, 35 years is a very long life for a power source. And uh, so I think so there are these, there are really five frontiers of space. There's the physical frontier, that is going someplace that nothing has been before. There's the knowledge frontier, understanding what's out there. Uh, there's the technology frontier, developing the capability of actually surviving in this new realm of human activity. And finally, there's, uh, there, there's the applications frontier, using space to better life here on Earth, and what I call the, the human frontier, which is learning how humans can be more effective in space, because space is, even today, still a challenging environment. Uh, those are the frontiers, and we need to find ways to make progress uh, on those frontiers, but it does mean choices, because these are immense frontiers. Uh, so choices are part of what we're trying to make in this workshop, and they will continue to have to be made, because we can't afford and we shouldn't afford to try to do everything. We should try to understand how we can best enable human activities in space, robotically and in person. Thank you. In this workshop, we actually set um, three uh, goals to achieve in, in our study. Is one is to uh, reach the same point as Voyager, the interstellar medium, in 10 years or less, rather than 36 years, to leave the, in, into the interstellar medium five to 10 times faster so we can reach further into the interstellar medium and to survive between 50 to 100 years so we can actually last and go between 400 to 800 AUs. And this seemed uh, quite a, a challenge, a technical challenge uh, to achieve in the next 10, 20 years. But relative uh, to uh, the vision that Freeman uh, Dyson had in the 50s and 60s, um, Freeman, you were imagining or uh, envisioning uh, human exploration uh, using a, a nuclear bomb propulsion uh, that may be achievable in a few hundred years. I think that's a, a human exploration going towards a star. H how do you see today, or your, your vision today, are, are, we, are we any closer, are we further away from achieving that, that vision? Or Oh, we're much closer. I mean, that was, of course, a, a completely stupid idea. <laughs> <laughs> but it was fun, to, fun, to, fun to, 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 to play with. But you know, now, the, the, uh, I mean, the best way of going fast in space is something called a laser-driven sail. That is, you have a very big, very light sail and a huge laser, which is probably in orbit in space, and it's your power source, so it doesn't go with the vehicle. The, the laser stays where it is, but you travel up the beam of the laser by using the sail. So you can have a small, very light spacecraft and go very fast. That's the much the more efficient way of traveling. So, and if, if, if we ever get to the stars, which I think we will, that's probably the way to go. And uh, so you can easily imagine that way, getting up to something like half the speed of light, which means you go to Alpha Centauri in 10 years, which is not so bad. And uh, I think that will happen. But on the way, of course, there are all sorts of other interesting places to stop over, which will, which, which, which will make the journey more interesting. Very good. So um, I'd like to invite uh, questions uh, from the audience, if anybody is uh, brave enough to ask questions. There are two uh, uh, microphones. And um, feel free to introduce yourself. And Right here. Hi, um, I'm Macy. I I go to Stanford. <laughs> um, actually, you are my hero. So I'm hi. I came here to meet you. Um, but one of my questions is: I agree with you that part of the biggest problems of traveling to interstellar space is the human aspect. But I was more concerned about actually the humans that would be making the trip. I was wondering how, like, if you guys in this conference have thought about the medical issues um, with long-term space flight, and if you've come up or thought of any solutions for that, you know, like, 
osteoporosis or like how would you reproduce in space like that kind of thing like how would how would we make sure that we survive all the way there to be able like and be functional so I let me differentiate a couple of things so the conference this workshop that we're doing that we're involved in is really about an interstellar probe we're not near the place where we would say not even me that would volunteer for the <laughs> interstellar mission yet we're not even close to there but the, a lot of the issues you're talking about are issues around humans in space exploration here in low Earth orbit on the moon or going to Mars. Um, interestingly enough, we, we have some ways to go. Um, there are a lot of, there's a lot of work around bone loss. We think we have some pretty good ideas around bone loss. Of course, once you get to an environment where there's gravity, where there's a, a lot more gravity and weight, you don't have those same issues. The same thing with cardiovascular deconditioning, where your heart weakens when you're not pumping against that mm -hmm. column of blood. I think some of the major issues that you're going to find for long duration space flight are going to really be around microbiomes, around those microbes that make up your gut that actually help you absorb your food, your immune system, all of that. While we're here on Earth, they're constantly being replenished. If you go someplace else, well, by the way, on orbit, in microgravity, things that were not patho pathogenic, that is the bacteria that was not aggressive, some of it becomes more aggressive, right? So things that were um, not that, that uh, problematic before become more problematic your immune system doesn't work as well. I think you also find that issue with agriculture. So the, micro, the microbes that help us, um, help plants absorb nitrogen and ut utilize nitrogen, what happens to them? I think those are going to be some of the issues around some of the smaller things. I think we'll figure out how to exercise and all of that. We probably will even figure out a lot about the radiation, but it's those other areas that I think may become stumbling blocks but it means that we have to pay more attention to hear them here on Earth. It provides us with a platform to look at them. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, let me just add to, to uh, that if you want to go and take a look at the uh, website of NSBRI, the National Space Biomedical Research Institute, a lot of these topics, and at NASA there's a pretty big program addressing a lot of these topics today. Awesome. Thank you. Over here. My question is somewhat related to the Noah's Ark egg. I guess this might be a little bit early to start thinking about this, but if there is actually other life out there, have we thought about how we would determine that and whether, like the ethics behind basically taking life and all of our microbes and everything out into space where we might interact with other living beings? Freeman? <laughs> yes, these are questions which we have to, to, to deal with. And of course, we already have made very stringent precautions against contaminating Mars and, and, and other places where we visited. It's, uh, it, 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 it's something we take, uh, take very seriously. And uh, how it works out in the end, of course, nobody knows. In the end, it, 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 it's, it's a very different situation if the universe is already inhabited or if it is not. And so we have to answer that question first. And that'll take, what, that'll take, take a while. In the meantime, <laughs> we, 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 just, we, we will be as careful as we can. Thanks. Hello, my name is Skylar, and this was a great talk. Thank you very much for stuff. Um, so I kind of had a question on, I guess, the material science end of space travel in the long term. Are we looking at, if we're looking at like a 50 year journey to the nearest star and sending probes like that, are there any frontiers, you know, um, spacecraft material, batteries, or, you know, um, any, other any other materials we'd have to look at that we're already up to snuff? Have we met like any of the technical specifications, if you will, to make something that could reach Alpha Centauri and not fall apart in 50 years? And if it's not, what are some milestones we're looking for, like to be like, okay, we're materialistically ready? Yeah, well, I'm not an engineer. I don't know the details <laughs> of that. It's uh, generally speaking, if you take the Voyager mission, for example, which has now been flying for 35 years, the, 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 everything works amazingly well. And, and so it's possible to build reliable machines. We, we've done it. And 
So I have no doubt we will, we, will, we will build reliable machines to get to the stars. I don't see anything that particularly difficult about that, but of course the, we'll find out when, when we actually do it. So I, I would uh, just say that um, um, in, uh, in the workshop that we're, we're um, conducting this week, we've purposely set the goals kind of uh, as a challenge, and you heard the way I articulated it, to go, you know, do it in 10 times, 10 years uh, um, or, or less, leave 10 times faster, last 50 to 100 years. And that's, that's a challenge. We're not talking about Alpha Centauri. We're not talking about anything uh, that far away. And so it's, uh, there are challenges in that realm in almost every dimension. And, that, and that's a challenge from today's point of view. Materials, uh, electronics, autonomy, navigation, you name it, it's, it's not a simple matter. But I, I agree in, in, in principle with, with, with Freeman that uh, from a, from a long-term perspective, we, we know how to build reliable systems. And a topic that I'm personally interested in is, for example, hibernation. Hibernation on, at the human level where we don't, we, we're not there yet, but on a spacecraft level, turning off systems lasting much longer because the, the system is not powered, we can actually survive many decades, maybe many hundreds of years, by managing hibernation uh, on a spacecraft. Some of the showstoppers and key things that, that, that we need is nuclear power. There's no other source of energy on the way, so uh, nuclear power is, is a big deal, and certainly communications and, and other topics. But there are challenges in every dimension. And may I add on to that? I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump out on a limb here and say that one of the issues that I believe we're seeing as we hear the questions is sort of a generational divide, which is so the, the folks here were not born when we went to the moon. It's not a big deal. It's no big whoop, right? Uh, right? It's no big whoop for you, right? We were on the moon. Yeah, it would be great. We go back in five years. What's the big deal? But, but being able to go somewhere else is that challenge that would make a difference. Since you were born, you know, Jupiter, we had seen Jupiter up close and personal. We had seen Neptune up close and personal. We've been on Mars a couple of times. None of this is particularly amazing. This bunch, we're sitting up here, ooh, we were so cool, we got to see the moon and all that <laughs> stuff. And so I think that divide is, can we push to do something faster rather than saying that we can't do any better and this is the best we can do. I think our challenge is to say, we want, if we wanted to do this in, in 50 years, how would we get a probe that far? We didn't say the size of the probe, anything else. So, I would ask you to, you see those people sitting right there? <laughs> to challenge them to think bigger and say how you're gonna help them to think bigger and bolder uh, so that we can say we would try to take something on that we don't know how to do right now. So you're saying we should hire the young people who don't know they can't be done. <laughs> there. <laughs> Sign me up. <laughs> And, and I would say that, the, but they do need the people to help teach them the art and stuff, but don't keep telling folks no, right? Don't keep telling them and they can't do it. You're hired. <laughs> thank you. Hi, uh, thank you guys for having us all. Uh, my name is Jessica Hendrickson and I just started my own science web series. So I'm here to, for that. Um, I guess my hypothetical question is, if we do solve the propulsion problem for probes, and say we go out past Alpha Centauri, past Barnard Star, and maybe Reflection Nebula, how do we solve the problem of the time delay of getting that information back to Earth? Well, for me, that's one of the real advantages of being so far away that you are out of reach of the tax collectors. <laughs> 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 you, can, you can put that in your newsletter. <laughs> I, I don't think you'll get a better answer. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> you know, I, I was going to encourage the young to come up uh, and ask questions, but I don't think I need to do that. That's, that's really 
Thank you so, uh, thank you so much just for uh, opening this up to questions. Um, I guess my question is another more philosophical one uh, for the panelists. Um, you were talking about biotech and that being like a really big frontier for feasible colonization of any other world. But I'm wondering with biotech kind of growing at a at a steady rate, but artificial intelligence growing at an extremely fast rate right now, what role the panelists feel uh, artificial intelligence has in kind of exploration of space and uh, with advances in kind of autonomous technology and these type of things? I, I would maybe take exception to that, that uh, juxtaposition. Um, I think that biotechnology has a uh, is, is growing pretty rapidly, in fact, in sometimes frightening ways to how much, how rapidly it's growing and how, how commonplace it's becoming. So I wouldn't say that biotech is sort of dead in terms of approaching these problems or moving very slowly. Um, so how, how AI can work, I, I, in, in we're at the place where people can talk about AI, it's, it still requires that there's a lot of things we can automate. I think as we were talking about some of the probes and the possibility, there's lots of things we can automate. But we still have to um, figure out what it is we want to study, what it is we want to get done, if that, that makes sense. I think a lot of the technologies are much smaller, right? We, we'll be able to put more into a spacecraft or a vehicle. So I do have a a perspective uh, on this. When you look at most of our, all of our robotic uh, spacecraft, um, to kind of channel a little bit of Freeman Dyson uh, approach here, they're very dumb. They're, they're, they're totally, they're very, very simple from a, from a, as a finite state machine, as an automata, they're very, very simple and predictable. And we like it that way because if something goes wrong, you can interrogate the machine, you can find out what's its state, and you can fix problems. But in the future, certainly when you go far away, you can't do that. You have to build eventually spacecraft that are self-conscious, that do have artificial intelligence, that do are able to assess their own state, not call back home and say, what do I do? But to be self-aware of its deficiencies, of its abilities, and to react. And that's a, that's a frontier yet to come. There's a lot of progress being made today in artificial in intelligence and in brain-based systems. There's a lot of good research going on. And I think that's all a precursor to eventually building uh, robotic systems that can actually be intelligent and, uh, and, and safe themselves and perform the functions that were uh, given to them. Where, uh, you know, our space missions of today are not like that. Thank you. Question here. Hi, I'm Max Blackley. I'm a seventh grader. Hello. And I have a question for Dr. Dyson. Um, with your uh, laser sail idea, if the laser is pushing from behind, how would you slow it down? So I didn't understand the question, I'm sorry. Uh, how would you slow it down if you're pushing it with a laser? Yeah, that's a big problem. <laughs> <laughs> You can do it. it, it I mean, there's, there's a, 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 an answer to the question, but it's not very elegant that you have to take a piece of your sail and use it as a reflector to re reflect the laser beam back again onto the back of the other part of the sail. So you have a, one piece which is acting as a reflector reflecting the beam backwards, and then the backwards beam slows down the other part of the sail. So that's a te technically possible solution. It's not at all elegant. It's, it, it's not at all efficient. There probably are better ways of doing it, but uh, one possibility is to, to use the interstellar magnetic field to slow yourself down. You have to gen generate some big electric currents and push against the magnetic field and use the magnetic field as a brake 
So th th that in principle works, again, not very efficiently. So we shall, it's a problem which we haven't yet solved, but I think in principle you can do it. Excellent question. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Pedro. Uh, I'm, it's an honor to be like by, behind such a like, distinguished panel. Um, my question is generally about the goal of having a spacecraft reach that um, a, a bow shock in a tenth of the time. Um, one, it seems to me that uh, terrestrial construction seems to be a, a, a limiting uh, factor in terms of the amount of energy required to get things off of the Earth and then into space. Um, so do you guys see uh, building in the solar system as being um, a, a potential uh, to decrease the amount of energy cost required to build things and get things out into space in, in general. And secondarily, um, the M drive, I, uh, I, I've read a, a couple things on. Um, what do you guys feel about that in terms of a feasible propulsion system? So, um, <laughs> there's, so some of the ideas behind one very interesting idea right now is thinking about a space elevator, right? So the work that's being done looking at a, a study where you would place a platform basically in a very quiescent spot in the ocean, basically you'd have a 100 kilometer, 100,000 kilometer tether up into orbit and then over time you'd be able to create this elevator that can go up and down this tether in a week's time. Um, the miracle that happens in that place is really sort of getting the right can, kind of nan, nano uh, tubule, nanoparticle tubule, to be able to to have the sort of the strength and uh, right characteristics to be able to be that tether. That's the problem. But it's a very interesting technology that would keep you from having to launch constantly, which is which is a, a impediment. What about actually harvesting material in the asteroid belt? Is that even feasible, or is that sort of content not Well, really there, there are lots of us? people who are talking about that, but you still have to get enough up into Earth orbit. So I'll, 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 um, just to add, the uh, M drive. To get so, some, some of the technologies that we're considering in the workshop are uh, using existing propulsion and using propulsion that is under development, for example, solar sails, are an example of propulsion uh, uh, systems that are going to be demonstrated or have been demonstrated, will be demonstrated, and, and will scale. But there are other techniques where you can use existing propulsion, go and swing close to the sun, and use a, 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 a solid rocket motor to accelerate and, and get swung out of the, of the solar system at high velocities. There are various gravity assists and so on. There's electric propulsion. There are a number of different techniques. Uh, in our study, we kind of anticipate that getting uh, to the point of Voyager in, in um, 10 years rather than 30-something years is within reach. It's, it's, uh, it's not impossible. It's challenging. It would require that you develop a thermal protection system that will allow you to go close to the sun and use that, uh, the, the, the gravity and the proximity of the sun to, to swing by and, 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 and leave at high velocities. So there is a, there is a menu of options that are, that are available. It's not, at this point, inconceivable at all. Um, so that's, that's primarily the answer. Hi, my name is Monty Decker, and I'm in, I'm in seventh grade. Um, what, if we found life out there, what what caution would we take, and what would we investigate in? If we knew that there was life out there. Yeah. And if we were to encounter life. Freeman, that's your topic. What's the question? <laughs> <laughs> what would we do, what would we do if we, if and when we encounter life? Yeah, out? well, of course we would <laughs> talk to it, and, and <laughs> <laughs> with luck it might even answer. <laughs> So, I mean, clearly, the, 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 the wonderful thing about life is it's always unexpected and unpredictable. We don't, we don't know at all what we would do, except clearly we would try to understand it as well as we can. It might be very difficult. I, mean, I have a good friend who spent his whole life 
listening to conversations of orca whales. <laughs> and the orca whales are very social animals. They live together in big groups with their grandparents and grandchildren. grandchildren and they're constantly talking to each other in a language we don't understand. After 40 years of listening, he still doesn't understand the language. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a challenge. Okay. That's the best you'll get. <laughs> Hi, I was wondering about uh, dealing with the issue of propulsion, um, seeing as it seems a light sail would be one of the most efficient is one of the best ways, uh, if you use some sort of microwave or radio wave laser to accelerate on a, a lighter type of sail, and if that would be uh, more efficient for reaching your goal of the bow shock. That's clearly w one of the things we're looking at, and that's what uh, Freeman was mentioning in terms of even... Yeah, for very high speeds, it's certainly more efficient. For low speeds, it's not. And, and, uh, so it's a question what you want to do. And, and it's also, a, it, it's, it's a kind of a system, it works very well if it's a public highway, so you can use the same uh, capital expenditure for many missions, but it, it's very expensive if you only use it for one mission. So it requires a, a high volume of traffic to make it economic. Thank you. Sure. Hello, I'm, uh, my name is Tushar Thirikraman, I'm from uh, JPL. And um, thank you very much for this conversation. It was very enlightening. Um, I think we all really appreciated it. Um, my question is a little bit different. It's actually about um, sort of how you fund this and whose sort of responsibility is to fund this effort. I know we, right now you're getting funding from lots of different sources, but you're talking about 100 years from now, like do you see the US leading this? Do you see this International Courses Consortium leading it? Like where, how is the funding gonna happen to make this happen? I can say a few things and then and may... Uh, so this is a challenge, there's no doubt about it, and we're trying in this workshop really to sort of set that aside so that we are not overly inhibited by that perhaps pessimistic answer. Uh, because we'd like to first uh, more contemplate the right vision, the right uh, missions, the right steps, regardless of how it would be funded. Uh, we're very well aware that proposing something that is uh, unaffordable is, is not the right answer. So it's a, it's a balancing act. Um, but during the workshop, there are a number of topics have come up that perhaps targeting NASA, which is our normal, normal expectation and, and as a customer and as a, as a funding source, is not necessarily the only or necessarily the best way. And so uh, May uh, brought this up and, and others that the reaching to the public, doing crowdsourcing or doing something that goes in a kind of a more democratic way, just going to the, to the world and seeing if something uh, that is so exciting and, and so motivating to, to, to the population across the world uh, may be, just may be, uh, another, another way. So we're kind of trying to not be limited by one funding source at this point, not limit our vision, and not limit the, 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 the results of the workshop. But ultimately, we'll have to face that. May? And, and I want to do something really uh, quickly again, is to differentiate these particular, there are lots of potential projects and probes and things that can happen. This is not a single step you know, we start now and you end up in Alpha Centauri with one leap. When you think about it, there are multiple kinds of technologies that have to be proven, even for a probe, even with something without people on it, right? So we're not even at that point yet. So you can look at funding much smaller demonstration missions in certain ways. You can look at the big large missions in other ways. Um, some kind of, um, way we're gonna to have to come up with a mechanism where we can fund things based on um, sort of future investments that it brings. Can, for example, the country sort of put together bonds, right? Just like we put together bonds for schools and things like that, could we put together bonds for projects? That might be some mechanisms. But don't take this as a monolithic single project 
that everyone is trying to do, put everything in the one egg, <laughs> that we're gonna <laughs> actually, it's really stepwise. And, and so it's not a single project and there would be multiple funding mechanisms because there would be multiple projects. Excellent. Go ahead. Yes, my name is David Harrison. Uh, I just uh, want to address uh, uh, Dr. Stone and Dr. Jemison. I just wanted to say, I have two quick questions that I wanted to, oh, well, two questions I wanted to ask is that <clears throat> notwithstanding with whether there's going to be a, any major advance in propulsion, I know Dr. Uh, Franklin Chang Diaz was coming up with something about that. If we were to send a mission beyond the orbit of Saturn and we were to come back, it would take maybe 15 to 17 years. If we, is there any, um, anything as far as artificial gravity being, uh, any technological advances as far as that is? Because with, like someone once said earlier, once somebody asked a question about the deterioration of the body and, and, and all the other things that go on and as far as gr uh, growing uh, food and everything. Has that been solved? Has that been worked on? As far as like, as far as artificial gravity is like, is has there been any plans as far as any advancement in that? Well, I, I can tell you that uh, there is work in artificial gravity at NASA. Has been for many years, at uh, MIT, at the JSC, and so on. And there are experiments uh, in on ground uh, in, in rotating uh, platforms looking at the uh, ability to generate uh, artificial gravity and, and how it, it affects various aspects of the human body. But um, uh, nothing on the scale of what you might imagine in, in Odyssey 2001 or, or Arthur C. Clarke kind of a artificial gravity. But it's been under study for many years at NASA. So Chang, Chang Diaz's work was really about having continuous acceleration yeah. along the way, and that was what would be generating quote unquote the artificial gravity is because you'll have continuous acceleration, gives you a short trip in profile, you turn around and you break, that's another type of acceleration, gives you, a, gives you artificial gravity. So I don't know if that's what you're talking about. That was one idea about how do you get over the effects on the human body of weightlessness because, because over a longer period of time. Because the human body starts to deteriorate. It can deteriorate rapidly if it's, I mean, it can deteriorate to the point where it would never be able to recover after two years or something well, like you, that. Well, you lose a lot of bone. If you don't, if you're not, if, if your body is not, if your bone is not supporting weight, you lose bone. Right. And so that deterioration is, is damaging. And the same thing with cardiovascular deconditioning. You get to the place where all of a sudden you're in, gra in a gravitational field again, and you're at one G and are a third G, and your heart can't handle it okay. because it's deteriorated. But it was that the constant acceleration, deceleration. So right. we're, we're, we're running out of time. I know, I know. Can I ask one more quick question? <laughs> There are well, a few more people here. I know, I know. One quick question, though. It's like down the road, if we were to develop spacecraft that can go out to the nearest a star, and if it takes so many years to get there, does the, if we were able to, to develop a propulsion that goes close to the speed of light, would time dilation also apply to non-living things like machinery and stuff like that? Would you be able to make a longer lasting spacecraft? Would, it, would the spacecraft only age like two or three years? Where it's <laughs> down here? I mean, it's, it's machinery with living things, non-living things works the same way in principle, I would think. It crossed the right. mind. Freeman? Perhaps. Yes, that's quite true. That's I mean, oh. But you have really to go fast to, for that to be important. I mean, while we age 100 years, the spacecraft might only age two years, so we still have plenty of fuel and stuff on the spacecraft <laughs> to be able to send transmissions and stuff. It's something that crossed my mind some time ago. So. Right. Very good. Okay, Next. thank you. Sure. Thank you. Real quickly. My, my name's Ken, and my question, coincidentally, is practically a follow-up to the gentleman previously at this microphone about motivation for the project. Um, you've talked a lot about crowdsourcing, kind of what I would might call this Star Trek model of public excitement. Um, a lot of historical exploration has been motivated by the desire of people to escape disasters or get new land for themselves or get rich in one way or another. Could you talk a little bit about the role you might see of private exploitation to motivate these and how that might lead to different kinds of missions than ones that you've been talking about maybe? Yeah, well, we have, of course, a fairly large space industry already. It's, uh, and it's growing at about the same speed as other industries. 
so no doubt that will continue. And of course, the bigger the industry is, the more likely it will be willing to fund public sporting events, which the public is willing to pay for. So I would see a bright future there, which is quite independent of governments. So we have really only time for one more question. I apologize. Uh, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I was just wondering if somebody could tell us about that solar gravity lens focus. That sounds pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Uh, there is, uh, we have about 15 minutes here to interact with the workshop participants and with the panelists. And there are a few people I'll show you who know a lot about that topic. OK? So with that, I'd like to thank our, our panelists. Uh, and thank you all for attending this evening. It's been a pleasure uh, fielding your questions. And thank you for being here.